So we're starting a series on deliverance and setting the captives free. And it's going to be an integrated approach in how we teach this. Where, you know, I'm going to be teaching, my husband's going to be teaching, probably others will be teaching. But we want to integrate, I'm going to teach hardcore tonight what the, Lord, what the Word of God teaches about deliverance. But we're, we're also going to implement what we learned from Elijah House with bitter roots and performance and basic trust and um, soul ties, right? And, and uh, you know, all at different aspects of inner healing because more than ever... We need to understand this. We need to walk out our deliverance, right? And so it's God's desire for all of us to walk in freedom and victory. That's just his desire for us. But I, I tell you, there's so many Christians that are not. And this isn't to shame anybody. This is to encourage you and to know the authority and power that we all have. And, and listen, freedom, demons are easy, We'll address that tonight, but it's the mindsets and it's the strongholds in our life. And so a lot of times this is a progressive. I know for me, a lot of freedom that took place was progressive. It didn't happen overnight for me. And so, you know, when they were crossing the Red Sea, it was progressive. It took them days to get through. It, you know, it didn't happen in like one hour. It was progressive, okay? So we're crossing over to the other side. The Lord is splitting the Red Sea for us, amen? And we're going to the other side. But even though at times, you know, you see the Egyptians that are right behind them, and, and you know, and, and we see like the enemies behind us are trying to pull stuff with us. But let me tell you something. God's got our back, amen? So... Um, I said here, I wrote in my notes, deliverance, is, there's an immense need for deliverance, and it's really missing in the body of Christ. I mean, I'm just surprised by still how many people, how many churches do not teach about deliverance. And, you know, they say deliverance isn't for today. Well, why are there so many people struggling? Why are there so many people that aren't set free, don't know how to walk out their freedom with fear and trembling in the Lord? We have, you know, great power and authority in God. The Bible says that it's not by might nor power, but it's by his spirit, that his spirit, it's by him. He's directing us and giving us strategies. When I got saved, I thought, I can't stand this miserable life. I need to know if I can live a life of peace and joy, despite that we have problems, and that I can be free from depression and hopelessness and despair and suicidal thoughts, I want it. Wouldn't you want it? You mean Jesus died on the cross for us, for us to live in bondage? Heck with that. I wouldn't serve God if that wasn't for real. At least in the world, we had drugs, we had alcohol, we had all these different things. Not that that was good, but it was something to help relieve of your pain. But see, God has the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, the word, speaking in tongues, worship. See, we can't take that for granted. It's that powerful. And the enemy hates it. So in John 10, 10, we know it says here, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But what? God says, I, I, I don't have all the scriptures up there, so you, you're, you're good up there. I'll let you know. I changed everything. I, I sent in my notes, and of course, I changed everything again. But So the thief comes to steal, but he says, but I've come to give you that life more abundantly. And that was my thing, and I've shared this here before. I thought, I'm not living an abundant life. I was saved. Are you living an abundant life, right? Are you online living an abundant life? Doesn't mean you're not ever going to have problems in life. Many are the afflictions, he says, but I'll help you. And I'll help you get through and I'll teach you how to walk in victory. And so deliverance means to rescue from bondage or danger. All right. And a ministry of deliverance involves not only breaking evil against us, but we're going to talk tonight about casting out devils. And you'll see the authority that Jesus has given to us to do this. Now, not everyone is called to be in a deliverance ministry. It's just not your desire. It's okay. But we're all called to know how to deal with this. All right? And so demons, um, you know, they like to take up residence in an individual. And a lot of times we're dealing with people, you know, that we're counseling. They've done everything. You know, um, they're, they're worshiping, they're praying, but they're not getting any relief. And so what we say here is we don't, we don't counsel demons. We cast them out. And if you're having an ongoing problem for a long time and you're not getting relief, honey, that is not your lot in life. Jesus came to set the captives free, period. All right? So, um, so anyway, so, a lot of, so what are like some of the open doors? You know, we have idolatry, the sexual sin. It's so perverse out there. And even it's infiltrated in the church with sexual sin. 
and it's an open door. And I don't care how you reason it out, it's something that will take you out, okay? So we have sexual sin. I'll get into that a little later on. Maybe not tonight, but we'll deal with this. Infirmity, all types of sicknesses, right? Bondages, fears, all types of fears. You know anybody that's battling with fear? Okay? And listen, I know how, how awful fear is because I really struggle with it, so I empathize with that. And I'm not, again, when I'm addressing this, it's not to put anybody down, but we can't tolerate it or coddle, coddle this thing. We have to take authority over it or cast it out. Because the Bible says in Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 7, what does it say? We all know, we're all, you know, people here have been here forever. God has not given us a spirit of fear, it's a spirit but of power, love, and of sound mind. And I said, Lord, I am not going to allow this stinking spirit of fear to dictate to me and tutor me and tell me what I'm to do and what I'm not to do. It's not happening. But that's where, again, we have to meditate on the word. Psalm 91. I have Psalm 27. I mean, there are so many scriptures. There's actually 365 scriptures on fear. There's a lot of scriptures. One for every day, right? There's a lot of scriptures. And so God knows what we're made up of. He knows how we'll battle. And so right now, I mean, there are a lot of us that have been saved forever. But, but what's gripping you right now? If it's fear, then we deal with it. If it's depression, we deal with it. Don't just blow it off or hide and stay at home and isolate. Don't do that. Come on. We have to know that we know our God has our back. God goes before us and he's a rear guard. And so... Um, you know, he tries to oppress us. So when you look up the word oppression, it's an act or an instant instance of oppressing or subjecting to cruel or unjust restraints. Isn't that like what some of these things, some of these things that are happening in the world right now is happening? You know, with this pandemic. And I mean, listen, we listen. Here's what the, the enemy wants to do. He wants to neutralize the power and authority that we have. We are called to legislate, and I'm really jumping ahead of my notes, but we're called, our prayers make a difference. Our decrees make a difference. Knowing who we are in Christ makes a difference. Listen, China wants to, you know, have a uh, breakout in war. You have the, um, uh, Russia and the Ukraine. You know, you have all this stuff going on. There's a possibility of a third world war, third world war. So world war, can't even speak. We have to pray. We make a difference. But if you don't know who you are, he wants to knock you out of your authority, cause you to live in intimidation and fear, knock that authority out of us so that we don't know who the heck we are in Christ. So in the scriptures it says, oh, wait a minute, uh, uh, sorry, the oppression, the state of feeling heavily burdened mentally or emotionally by troubles, adverse conditions, and or anxiety. That's another definition of, of oppression. Have many people been oppressed? I know it tried to t attack me. Listen, none of us are immune to this. And when I'm speaking here tonight, I'm not speaking again at you. It's, it's, I mean, it's something that we all have to address and we all have to deal with. Listen to the scripture. I'm going to read a lot of scripture here tonight. I think this is on my handout. In Mark 16, 17, and 18, and I'd like to read it to you out of the Passion. And these miracle signs will accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power in my, of my name. They will speak in tongues. They will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisonous and from anything poisonous that's injected into us. And they will lay hands on the sick and will heal them. Amen? So that's one of the, one of the scriptures, and I'm going to read a lot tonight, about the authority that Christ has given us. And I want you to hear me tonight that we have such incredible authority as Christians. We have it. But he doesn't want you to know that you have it. All right? And so all Christians carry authority. But not everyone feels it, but it's not a feeling thing. It's a by faith thing, okay? So listen to Luke 4, 19, 4 I'm sorry, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19 in the Passion. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to bring hope for the poor, healing for the brokenhearted, new eyes for the blind, and to preach to prisoners. You are set free. That's our mandate. And I, I was thinking about it today. Think about it. The Lord came to heal our broken hearts, to heal the places of disappointment and hopelessness and and, and just no joy. He came to heal and, and, and even restore what's been stolen. Isn't that awesome? He said, he says here that, um, 
that he wants us to be set free. He said, I've come to share the message of Jubilee for the time of God's great acceptance has begun. Isn't that awesome? Um, so Jesus came to, to preach salvation to us and to destroy every demonic attempt of the enemy in our lives. And then uh, in Mark chapter 3, in, uh, 13 and 15 in the Passion, afterwards, this is when Jesus went to choose the 12 apostles, and it says, afterwards, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to himself the men he wanted to be his close companions. So they went up with him. He appointed the 12 whom he named apostles. And he wanted them to be continually at his side. Isn't that just what Jesus is saying to us? He wants us continually in his presence so that he can send them out to preach and have authority to heal the sick and cast out devils. You're going to see that tonight. Heal the sick, cast out devils. Heal the sick, cast out devils. Because a lot of sicknesses are demonic. Not everything, but there are demons in, in, you know, where there's sickness. So I can say... In all the years that I've been saved, and I've been saved a long time, the ministry of deliverance has been the most rewarding. Seeing a transformed life, seeing a life that's been in utter bondage and despair, and see them walk in freedom. That's a passion of mine, is to see people walk in their destiny and to walk in freedom. To not stay stuck in a stinking religious mindset where we have no, no freedom, you can't be honest, you're not truthful, you can't really say what's, not your, you know, what's going on. How do you get free from stuff if you don't talk about what's going on in your life, if, you don't, if you're not transparent? For too long in the religious system, you had to, I was told, trust God and get over it. Well, I'm trying to trust God, but I didn't know how to get free. So Jesus is teaching us how to get free. He's been teaching us. But as a system says, there's a certain uh, a religious sect that says it's not happening. This is how it is. You're messing up. You're not good enough. And then what's that? It's that cycle of here even in church, I'm not getting affirmed. I'm not even feeling like I can, how am I going to ever change? How am I going to deal with this fear? How am I going to, you know, I'm always told what I'm doing wrong and not affirming what I am doing right. Okay, that was the system. Not that, that people were intentionally trying to do, it's what they knew. That's not God. I learned, when I started to get a revelation of the love of God, that's when my life starts turning around. Amen? And so the Bible makes it clear that Jesus wants the body of Christ to be made whole. Jesus wants us to walk in freedom and to know that we don't have to be stuck. So I want to encourage you. You don't have to have a destructive behavior. If you're struggling with any kind of addiction, you don't have to stay there. It may seem overwhelming when you're in it. But I promise you, God always have a, has a way of escape for everything that we're dealing with. This is not our lot in life. And so, but you need church. You need, you, you need to be in the atmosphere. You need to, to, that's why he wants us to be in fellowship. Don't, what does Hebrews say? Don't forsake the fellowshipping of one another. We need each other. We get a word for each other. We speak to each other. We help each other. When one is down, we're all, we have our arms around him and carrying everybody forward. When I'm down, I need people to get me and help carry me forward. We're not always on top. We, we have stuff too. And so um, anyway, so some of the, the personality, and I know many of you know this, but I, I know I need to teach it. Satan's, um, his name means he's an accuser and, or he's an opponent. He's our opponent. Some of the names for the devil's adversary, he's a liar. He's the father of lies. That's the lie that's constantly manipulating you and me and trying to keep us in the, on lockdown. He's a liar. And, and he's a murderer. Uh, some of his names are destroyer, serpent, Apollyon, Belial, Ab Abaddon. And he's the god of this world. He's a deceiver, and he makes a mockery out of Christianity. Why in the world would you want to serve him? But we may not be, you know, there's, there's people certainly, and we'll discuss that in one of our sessions in the satanic occult and everything. But see, Christians can just align with his lies, and we'll discuss that in a minute. And so his goal is to bring confusion. His goal is to, to destroy us. His goal is to, to um, cause strife and division. Sounds like what's going on in the world, right? And the enemy, he causes illness, he causes torment, he torments our mind, he uh, exploits human weaknesses. 
the enemies behind every false religion and idolatry. He exerts influence over our world systems, right? And so uh, we, we see this in the scriptures. Um, and they, uh, you, you know, demons can attach themselves to inanimate objects, right? And so anyway, there's a lot of witchcraft. We're going we're gonna to discuss in, in one of the classes, we're going to talk about um, Python, the spirit of Python. We're going to talk about Leviathan. We're going to talk about the spirit of witchcraft because they all work together. There's this, also the spirit of religion. And we have to know to identify that. And one of our other classes we're going to teach on is discernment. Now, we all, uh, the Bible says that we all have to practice to learn and to discern. Okay? And so that's, a, that's something that the Lord wants to develop. Some, in some people, it's highly, it's more developed than others. But we can develop this stuff. All right? So in Revelation 20, just so, even though I'm talking about the devil, I love this scripture. <laughs> I'm going to throw this in there. In Revelation 20, 10, the passion, it says, Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the place with the wild beast and the false prophet and the lake of fire and sulfur where they will be tormented day and night. He tormented us day and night. Well, that's where he's going. And like I was saying earlier today in, in Isaiah, you know, where we'll look at him and say, Are you the one that was tormenting me? You're the one? You see, we magnify him a little too much. Now, outside of Christ, yeah, the enemy has powers. But in Christ, we have authority over him. And the way he infiltrates us is through our minds. And if you don't know the word, you don't know how to stand and fight. You're going to think everything's a devil. Not everything is a devil. He's not that good. Not everything's a devil. And so and that's what we have to recognize, because I'll hear that from so many people, how the enemy is always on the attack. Well, of course he's going to be, but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He's not my focus. I, you learn how to take authority over the enemy, and this is really key for deliverance, because you're, you're overwhelmed and you're bombarded by the attacks of the enemy, and you're learning how to walk in the freedom of Christ. So more all you know in the beginning especially you need those you need strong people around you to help you but in addition to that you need to meditate on the word of god and that you know i say that all the time that it's the revelation of the truth of the word that sets us free amen that was the, that was the main thing cuz you have to understand and at the time i mean we had to go like undercover doing deliverance when i got saved Oh, you can't have a demon. Oh, that's ridiculous. You know, we're a new creation in Christ. Yeah, we are a new creation in Christ. Our spirit man is born again, but our soul isn't. If that's the case, then why isn't everybody just doing great? <laughs> why aren't we all set free from everything? Come on. And that made it harder. And so I had to really get to that place of meditating on the word. I'm thinking, wait a second. I don't have to live this way. I had no hope. There are many people out there who don't have any hope. Maybe tonight you don't have hope. I didn't have hope. I didn't trust God. I didn't trust anybody. But I had to learn. And so I just want to give anyone hope. You can be in the worst place ever. But Jesus knows how to, how to reach you because his love for you will go after that one to set us free. And, and that's why I will never give up on this. Never. I will never back down. Because if you knew me and if I knew you, right, and you're all here on a Wednesday night, we wouldn't be serving Jesus if this thing wasn't legit, if Jesus didn't set us free, turn our lives around. Are we perfect? No one's saying perfect. And by the way, when you're looking up the word perfect in the Bible, it means to mature or maturity. It doesn't mean to be perfect, perfect. Jesus is the only perfect one. So listen to this. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15, I think I have it on the handout now. It says, that doesn't surprise us, for even Satan transforms himself as an angel of light. Because that is one of Satan's names. He's Lucifer and his light bearer. The Bible says he comes as an angel of light, and he's a deceiver. That's why we have to know the word of God. All right? So listen. All right, now I'll say it. All right, so he says, uh, Satan transforms himself uh, to appear as an angel of light. So it is no wonder his servants also go about pretending to be ministers of righteousness, but in the end, they will be exposed and get exactly what they deserve. All right? So the enemy knows his end is coming, and his goal is always to steal authority, always to come after our authority, always to, they, he wants us to worship him. So he led a rebellion against God. As you know, a third of the angels, they were all thrown out. And so... We're blood bought and we're redeemed. We're redeemed out of the, the grips of the enemy. 
And, and I'm sure many of you can come up here and testify of ways that you had to break free. I mean, there were times I remember. I remember one time, Peter, we were sleeping, and um, there was this entity that entered into the bed, my bedroom, and I couldn't move. I, the fear that came on me, and I'm trying to, you know, I wanted to punch my husband, get him up, like, help me, you know? I couldn't. And, and I saw this dark entity, and it actually looked like Dark Vader, and I didn't even watch those shows, but that's what it looked like to me. And I was trying to, I, I, the fear that came on me was overwhelming, and I thought, I just know from my neighborhood where I grew up, if you gave in to, for anyone coming after you to attack you, they'd beat you up even more. So I'm like, in the name of Jesus. And I couldn't even, I, I couldn't get the word out of my mouth. Finally, I was able to just say, Jesus! And I screamed, and the thing disappeared. And now, here I am a Christian. I'm strong in the Lord, you know. And, but this thing came into my room. So I'm like, what in the world? But see, a lot of times it's like, you know, he's always challenging us to see where we're at. Let's see if you believe. Let's see if you know who you are in Christ. He, they know when we know when we have authority. And so it was after that, you know, little at a time, these type of things were happening. And then I would see demonic manifestation in people. We saw some wild. I've seen people levitate. I've seen people go berserko. I've, I, the room has gone ice cold. The person literally transformed and before my eyes two times like a monster. I've seen it. But we've learned now how, like the process and what I'm going to teach tonight are ways to prevent that from happening. Because he wants a show. He wants a, you know, to be focused on him and you know, and then when he knows that, see, God gives us strategies and how to overthrow the enemy. Now, why am I teaching all this? Well, we're going to have the harvest is coming. And there's a lot of people out there that have really opened themselves up to some crazy stuff. And they need people. And, and listen, the Holy Spirit in you will, be, will give you insight in how to minister to people because they're not all going to be running the church. I got news for you. You're it. And you're going to minister the gospel, and you're going to minister, and there will be demons that will manifest, and you're going to have to know how to deal with it, just plain and simple. That was how I learned. I wanted no part of deliverance. People started manifesting in front of me. I had to learn. And so I'm like, oh, no. So it got to a point where I didn't want to look at people. I'd walk in a room and think, that's their problem. I'm not dealing with it. Because I didn't know how to deal with it. I was afraid, you know. And so um, I didn't have people teaching it. We didn't have a lot of teaching then. Right, Carolyn? You've been around a long time. We didn't have a lot of teaching then. Thank God for Derek Prince. I mean, you can still go online and watch Derek Prince. He's amazing. He's so good. So anyway, so as you know, when we're born again, our spirits are born again, not our souls. So we know in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, Now may the God of peace and harmony set you apart, making you completely holy. Now may your entire being, spirit, soul, and body be kept completely flawless in the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Now, <clears throat> our spirits... Our spirit man's born again, we have a soul, we have a body. And, and listen, God wants us to take care of our body. And so <clears throat> I think many, everybody here knows that your spirit man's born again, we have to deal with our soul, right? First Peter 5, 8 in the Passion. Now I know this is on my handout. Uh, it says, be well balanced and always alert because your enemy, the devil, roams around incessantly like a roaring lion looking for its prey to devour. He, I'm not going to be its prey. And see, he loves us to be afraid of him. And so God wants us to be alert. Not that we're focused on the devil. He's not my focus. Jesus is. You know? And so I, I do hear a lot of times from people, the enemy's after me. The enemy's after me. No. No. Make him run. <laughs> He's under your feet. Amen? So many are afraid. And some, some people have said to me they really have a hard time believing he exists. Well, that he's doing a good job. Because then if you meditate on the Bible and, and, and the Word, you'll know that he exists. And he's defeated. He's not victorious. He, we are victorious. And so our safety and our strength and our protection comes from the Lord. And so Jesus died again. He, he died. And you know, your scripture, he rose again. And he took what? The keys from the enemy. And so many, many, many Christians, again, we do a lot of counseling here, live dominated by the devil. 
Again, I'm not putting anybody down, but we've got to know our rights and our authority. And then we have to act it out even if your knees are knocking. Because there are many times that I thought, oh, Lord Jesus, why am I stuck in this situation? And, and I would get nervous, but I wasn't going to back down. And it's like a battle of, uh, of our authority and the enemy's trying to see where you're at. We've had demons manifest and challenge us and speak to us about our authority. And so at the heart of Christianity, we know is the cross. And that's our leverage, the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen, you just holding up a cross isn't going to do much. You have to live it. And the thing is, is that, you know, um, that we we are pure and holy and that we have a repentive heart. And I'll get into that in a minute. So in 1 John 3, 8, in the Passion, it says, But the one who indulges in a sinful life is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God was revealed or manifested was to undo and destroy the works of the devil. And so we have to understand that it says the reason he came was to destroy the works of the enemy. He loves us too much to keep us where we're at. So the enemy's strategy is to get us to to sin and to open up the door. So the enemy, uh, in Ephesians 4, it says, don't give the enemy a foothold. And so he will come, he'll try to plant thoughts in our minds, and, you know, you know, and I'll discuss that a little more. But we have to take every thought captive, don't we? If the enemy comes in and says, you know what, you're never going to amount to anything. You know, actually, you're such a low life, you should just hate yourself. And what are you going to do? Say, yeah, you're right. Well, many of us do. But what we have to say, I reject that in Jesus' name. I don't care if you believe 100% of the lie that's coming towards you. What does the word say? That's how you war. You war with the word. The word says, I'm his beloved. The word says, I'm his daughter or I'm his son. The, Lord, the word says, I have access. And that, that he watches over his word to perform it. And he loves me with an everlasting love. And his mercies are new every morning, right? So we have to recognize the, the, the attack. And if there's a pattern that's ongoing, you see, it's, the demons, as I said earlier, are easy. You cast them out. But if there's a belief system you have, that's what enables the spirit to stay. That's why when we minister to people, we want to find out where you're at. Because if you're believing the lie, you're giving that lie in the enemy the authority to stay there and and really just you know really harm you okay so we have to confess our sin we have to renounce what the um what the enemy is saying to us or in other words disown come out of agreement i'm not in alignment with you any longer he'll try to make you think that he's so big and bad and strong without jesus he is not in jesus i've been dealing with demons for many 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 years they all have to back down Not because of me, but because of my walk with him and because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the word and that we're his children and he protects us. Amen? In Mark Mark 16, 17 in the Passion, it says, And these miracle signs will accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power of my name and they will speak in tongues. That's for us. That's on the handout. You can put that up there. So, um... The verse tells us that we have greater authority. Remember the scripture in 1 John 4, 4. That's not on the handout. It says, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Who's in the world? Who's he talking about? The devil, right? So, so we have great authority. Another scripture that proves it. In Luke 9, 1, it says, Jesus summoned together his 12 apostles and imparted to them authority over every demon and the power to heal every disease. That's us. That's us. He imparted. He, tonight, the Spirit of the Lord is imparting to us great authority and to lay hands on the sick and to believe God for healing. All right? And so Luke ten nineteen says, Now you understand that I've imparted to you my authority, love this, to trample over his kingdom. You will trample upon every demon before you and o- overcome every power Satan possesses. Isn't that good? Absolutely nothing will harm you as you walk in authority. That's what the Word of God says. See, we have to believe that. And so, you know, we, we've seen some crazy things where the enemy, I mean, I remember one time, this, I was new in all this, and, and we went to minister, me and some other guy, to some girl. And um, I knew by, I had, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge 
that there is an antichrist spirit generationally in her family. So rather than talking with her, seeing how she's doing, you know, I was naive in all this, okay? I do teach a class on what not to do because I think I made every mistake that you can make. So I, I'd like to spare you of that. And I just went right after this thing. And she's sitting opposite me. And, um, and rather than walk her through forgiveness and renouncing the enemy and doing all that, which we'll talk about in a minute, <laughs> I went right after that thing. And literally before my eyes, she, she, she manifested into like a monster-like being. The room became ice cold, and I thought, oh, my God, I could be home right now. I'm in a cup of tea with my husband, and I'm here. What in the world did I do? What am I getting involved in? And I looked, and she, this person came to leap at me, and I heard the Spirit of God say, I'm a very present help in time of trouble. And when I heard that, I stood up and I slammed my hand on the table and I said, in the name of Jesus, because I'm thinking, girl, we're going to go at it. You're not going to take me out. And as I did that, because I stood up, the guy was paralyzed, frozen, a lot of help he was, and, and it came at me. And so I'm like, oh, my God. So as I took authority over it, honest to God, something picked her up, flung her clear across the room, her glasses went one way, her headband, her shoes went flying. And I'm thinking, and she's screaming on top of her lungs. And I'm like, okay, we're done tonight. I'm, I'm done. I'm not dealing with this anymore. So I'm like, okay, we calm her down. I'm like, okay, we're good now. In Jesus' name, you're good. You're good. I, I said, Lord. And the Lord said, you're not going to do that again. I learned since then. But, you know, there's a, there's a protocol. There's a strategy in how to deal with it. But it was very real what happened. I mean, I've seen, I mean, people make fun of it. I said, if only, like we have said, if only we had cameras in the room and we're ministering to people, deliverance, it's like, you know, the person starts, I, I, and you're like, you look up at the person like, oh, you are there, you know? And so another time, a guy literally, his, he became like the Hulk. And again, I was still pretty new in that one, and I run to the back of the room, and they said, quote Psalm 91, and I think I ran about 20 feet away from where the person was and I'm like he that dwelleth in the secret place you know I'm like quoting the scripture and so you know I learned through all the things that happened but the guy got set free what we will never have cameras in the room I promise <laughs> that's the fastest way to get nobody to come <laughs> no but I mean we would never do that but I'll tell you it's pretty intense anyway so you know Jesus you know said to um you know, Peter, you remember when Peter had his encounter and, and Jesus said to him, Peter, who, who, does, who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Christ. And so, and I want to read just a portion of it in Matthew 16, because um, Jesus says to him, um, for Peter, you are favored and privileged. And you didn't discover this on your own, but my Father in heaven has supernaturally revealed it to you. And I give you a name, Peter, a stone. And upon this rock will be my bedrock foundation on which I will build my church. It's not a rock. What it was, the foundation is the rock is Jesus Christ, okay? My, and I, here's what I wanted. I like the way uh, Brian put, Simmons put it here. He said, I will build my church, my legislative authority or my legislative assembly, then the power of death will not be able to overpower it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom and a realm. Wait, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, kingdom's realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden and in heaven to release on earth that which is released. And so when we're binding, literally means I forbid. And when you, you're loosing, it's I, I give you permission. You know, I open it up. And to, to bind is to forbid or to loose. And so he has given us that authority. We have the keys of the kingdom. We have authority. So those nights when, when those crazy manifestations happen, you know, we had the keys of authority, even though at the time my knees were knocking and, and like running way behind, you know, the, the, the table and the others, like he couldn't get me, right? And he was big. And this guy was... Um, a sensei, and he had uh, he had the highest level in karate, and then he would he would fight in Philadelphia, him against twenty guys and beat them all up. That's demonic power. Okay, so that's why I went a little further back behind him because I thought this guy's to beat twenty people up and take me up and flip you know flip me through the you know the the room and knock me out, and uh, and he wanted me in the room with him too because I brought him for deliverance. And so we saw a lot of amazing things that God set people free from. So 
So you get the point. Jesus wants to set us free. So their open doors are generational curses, right? We have bloodline curses. We have family issues. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. So that means we have a right to go after it and break the assignment off our lives and our family. People took that to mean, no, we never have to pray that. Well, I beg to differ with you. We deal with it all the time in people's lives. Why does a doctor ask you what your medical history is? They get it about generational issues. And so, um, so you'll, you'll, you'll hear the phrase generational curse or a familia, F-A-M-I-L, F-A-M-I-L, I A L spirit. It means ancestral. If you have familiar, which that's dealing with witchcraft and other stuff, but familia is dealing with family stuff. It's the idea of passing down. So you have in your family, you can have alcoholism, sexual perversion, homosexuality, you can have violence, you can have abandonment, all types of sexual sin, uh, addictions of all kinds. And so you have to identify if you haven't ever prayed through it. Once we get through, we're going to have a night of corporate deliverance. Because I want you to, to get this information. I want you to meditate, pray about it, ask Holy Spirit what I need to address. You don't have to dredge everything up. But, but, you know, we have a lot of junk in our lives, in our family. For many of you, you've had a lot of healing. For many, you haven't yet. It's okay. And so we never arrive either. And if you, if you want to read a really good book, and I've mentioned this before, Derek Prince, to me, has one of the best books on blessings or curses. And it says, You Choose. And if you don't have that book, I recommend you have that in your library. It's a really, really good book, all right? So we have to break curses that are in our life. Let's say, all right, so you don't have a generational curse in your family, but you have, let's say, a pattern of, of all failed relationship. And maybe no one else in your family had that, but you have that. It's a constant failure. There's something there. There was an open door that, that causes all these relationships to fail. Well, you know what? Then that could be a curse. And so a lot of times when I'm identifying these things or if I'm going through something, I just ask the Lord and I pray. I say, Lord, first of all, did I open up the door? Sometimes we're really not aware of what we've done. Other times we know we've been in sin. But have I opened up this door? And so, and then I renounce it and take authority over it. I renounce the lie. I re a lot of our word curses, a lot of the words we say, the devil doesn't need us. We're our own worst enemy at times because we're constantly cursing our lives. I'll never get ahead. I'm never going to be this. I'm never going to get a good job. I'm never going to have a good husband or wife. I'm never going to have my kids are always going to be rotten. Those are word curses. Death and life are in the power of our tongue. And so we're cursing. And you don't want to do that. Especially there's a lot of self-hatred that we deal with in people's lives. And if, listen, if, if you know, we're going to talk about forgiveness in a minute. And I know the time. We're going to end in like 10 minutes. But we have to choose to forgive ourselves as well as others. Amen. And a lot of times people heart, hold themselves in such unforgiveness and do not forgive yourselves. And that is an open door for the enemy, okay? So we want to break the curses. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And um, so we, we want to, to walk in that freedom. That's the beauty of Christ. When you, when you messed up and you feel so bad about it, you go before the Lord and repent and forgive yourself. You don't have to beat yourself up over it. That's what we do a lot of times. Listen to this in Colossians 2.14, the Passion. So good. He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record. I mean, you're exonerated. And the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto the cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. I'm telling you, that is awesome. And that's why you have to forgive yourself. And so once you have forgiven yourself and you go back and you constantly are repenting for the same sin, he's like, what are you talking about? That's wiped clean. Picture a, a, a you know, chalkboard. The eraser, you erase that. It's clean. You're, you're forgiven. And so, you know, what does the enemy constantly want to do? Bring up our past, have us constantly focus on it. And that's where you need to just tell him to shut up and say, oh, no, I've been, I've been forgiven. 
And there's a scripture in Isaiah. I know I have it here somewhere. In Isaiah 43. I only have it memorized in the King James, but I like how Brian Simmons has it. Um, in uh, Isaiah 43, 25, in the Passion, it says, I, yes, I am the only one and only who completely erases your sin, never to be seen again, and I will not remember them. Freely I do this because of who I am. Do you hear me? You don't have to keep bringing it up. When you've truly repented, it's done. And if the enemy, that's what he does, he whispers and torments and brings up the lie over and over. You need to say, basta, shut up in Jesus' name, I am forgiven, period. And when he sees that you mean what you say and you, you believe what the word says, he'll stop. He doesn't bother me with old stuff that he used to torment with me with because I don't believe, like, shut up. I, I'm already forgiven over here. I'm not listening to that. So that's what we have to do. And you so, used but, to do that to yourself in the beginning when I first met you. Yeah, yeah. That but, was, we, we know each other 37 years. Yeah, that was That's what I'm saying. Ago. Like, so what Trisha's saying, she had to live it because yeah. she was like her own worst enemy that kept rehearsing her own, um, you know, we all make mistakes, but she, you know, just kind of condemned herself. So it was real freedom when, when she could just st shut that off. So the enemy gave, I mean, the Lord gave me a picture one time because I was beating myself up, thinking what a turkey I am and blah, 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 and blah. You know how you all think about, well, I don't know about you, but I, but I thought about a lot of bad things about me, right? And I remember one time the Lord showed me a picture, and he said, this is what's happening. I saw an image of the devil sitting on a chair that he can rock on, you know, like a, in an office. And he had his hands like this, and he was laughing, and he had his feet up on a desk calling me a sucker. He didn't even need to torment me. I tormented me because I kept rehearsing the lies over and over. Oh, my God, I can't believe I did this. Oh, my God, I can't believe I said that. I sound so stupid. I can't, right? I mean, do we do this to ourselves at time or what? And that image of him making fun of me, calling me a sucker, I thought, no, he won't. And every time I go to get a picture, and the Lord would bring that picture to my mind, I'm like, oh, no, 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 that's not happening. Because, you know, you feel so bad, and, and everything in you wants to agree with the lie. But see, greater is he that's in us and he that's in the world. We don't have to stoop to that. Remember, he blotted out, he canceled out everything that was written against us. We're swept clean. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to, you know, mature in Christ. It just means he's not going to torment you. If you're battling with guilt and condemnation, that never is from God. I've said that many times here. It's in Romans 8.1. It says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't condemn. He convicts us. He doesn't condemn us. He doesn't put guilt on us. Half the church is feeling guilty half the time. We're not to be guilty. So... You know, anyway, so, so what's another open door? So sin, willful sin. Listen to this scripture in John 8, 34, in the Passion, it says, I speak eternal truth, Jesus said. When you sin, you're not free. You become a slave to bondage in your sin. So it's a deliberate action. You, you say, well, you know, I go to church. I'm doing my thing here. Are you watching R-rated movies? You know? Are, are, you, are you getting drunk? Are you partying? Are you looking at something you shouldn't be looking at? Are you looking at pornography? Men and women do it. Um, you know, is there immorality? Are you lying? Are you walking in unforgiveness? See, we can't get away with this stuff. And the thing is, we're entering, we're in 2022, the year 5782. It's, it, you know, yes, I believe that God has wonderful things. We'll be in Goshen. I do. But I'm going to tell you something. We can't straddle the fence. We have got either we're, we have a zeal for the Lord or we don't. Either we're passionate for Jesus or we don't, or we're not. We can't just be, oh, well, I don't feel like it tonight. Oh, I don't know. And, you know, I don't want to read my Bible. I'm telling you, those days are over. You're going to get your behinds kicked in plain English. And so God wants us to, to, to know who we are and to, to recognize and to deal with root systems, not blame everybody and their mother for your problems, but look at yourself where my issues are. Yes, there may, it may be circumstances that were caused because of others, but listen, I still have to own and take responsibility for my behavior and my thought process, right? 
So again, you know, we have to, like I said, Lord, I want every door shut. I'm looking to shut every door, but I want that zeal. I want that passion. It's not all about, you know, jerking and, and feeling, oh, I just want to be in the presence and feel that glorious presence. Well, let me tell you something about faith. Faith is not a feeling. And there are times when you're going through life where you're not feeling a goosebump. You're not feeling anything, but you have to keep on walking and trust God, and you're standing on the word. And above all that you've done, you're standing on the word. That's just the reality. And so many times when you don't know the word, you're falling apart. You're, you're, you know, and so many, like, are really struggling. And so we have it, but we're there for each other to help each other. But the enemy's a liar, and that's his goal is to take you out. Don't you dare let him take you out. So we have ungodly beliefs. Then I'm going to close. Our minds are full of untruths. And, and that's something that we learned. I mean, we've trained in so many different areas in deliverance. And this is one of the things that I, I trained in with um, Restoring the Foundations with Betsy and Chester Kilstra. And this one portion I absolutely love is the ungodly belief portion. Because in all the years of doing deliverance, that's what has kept most people bound. It's the, lie, it's the lies we believe. And I'll, I, you know, we have a forum, and we'll go through it with some people, and I, many people will say, no, I'm, I'm really good. I really have a good belief system in the world. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, <laughs> that's why you're here. But let's just fill out the form, and I want you to go through it, right? I'm like, are you kidding me? I still have stuff in that form that I'm working on, you know? And so then they go through, and they're like, oh, my God, I didn't know that was there. And then what, you, what they would have you do, and I still do it to this day in my own way, you would renounce the lie, get a scripture to counter the lie, craft a prayer, and prophesy that over your, yourself for 30 days. So where you're, you know, in that place that let's say you're battling with fear right now, because a lot of people are battling with fear, right? I used to struggle terribly with fear, and I had to be careful, and I really try to build myself up a lot in the word regarding fear. That's what I do. I have scriptures written all over the place, and I'm constantly praying and decreeing it over myself. That is a marvelous way. That's such a powerful way to combat the enemy. And then, you know, so you get all filled up with the word and worship, and then beam, boom, 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 like that. You could be in worship, and we're casting demons out. A lot of times during worship, we're taking authority over demons. You're not hearing it. You're not seeing it. You may hear a scream here and there, like Sunday, but um, that was a child, and he'll get set free. But... Um, some of the lies that we believe are what keeps us in bondage. All right, so tonight, what I want you to do, because I have so many, it's 8.30, I don't want to keep you any longer. Well, let me just say this. So we have ungodly beliefs, and then we have trauma and soul wounds, which we'll deal with. But get your ungodly beliefs, and really take this seriously, and write down any area that you may be dealing with, you know, like fear of sickness, or, you know, um, I, I don't know, just fear. Uh, could be hatred unforgiveness because I didn't even go into the unforgiveness piece that that unforgiveness is one of the main weapons the enemy uses to keep you bound by demons main it's one of the main things if we are praying for a person and bring them through deliverance and they will not forgive we will not go on with deliverance we can't because the enemy will wreak havoc on the individual we will not we'll have we'll just deal with other stuff but we will not cast demons out of that person and I have dealt with people, even myself, that have been saved a long time because we get familiar with things. And um, that, oh, I've, I've done that. I've done this. I prayed this. I've done, I'm like, oh, yeah? All right. And we start praying for them, and they have like 15 demons we're casting out of them. So, you know, it doesn't matter how long you're saved. I, I tell, I, you know, I go in for my spring cleaning. In August, I went through another, you know, I go in. I just want to make sure I'm dealing with all my junk because uh, none of us, None of us arrive. I've had leaders tell me they don't do deliverance because they're leaders. I would never have them pray for me. Never. Never. That's, that's serious. All the more we need help because we get cheap bites. There's, there's a lot of that's that, you know, you know, your own family you deal with, then you have other stuff that happens. I mean, are you kidding me? We all have stuff. So none of us are immune. So write down. So ask Holy Spirit. Or you don't have to ask them. Sometimes you just know what your problem is. You know, I'm having a real problem with forgiving someone. I just dealt with somebody the other day, and, and they're really struggling with family issues. It's serious. Really had a hard time with forgiving. And that, see, we need Jesus to forgive. When, you're, when we're that hurt, we need God. If, we, if God wasn't in the picture, we can't forgive. 
So that's why I always have people, uh, you know, I preface it by I choose to forgive. Lord, bring in the healing in my heart. It's progressive. And we, you know, like somebody may, maybe was snotty to you. It's different. Okay, well, I'm having a hard time forgiving them. Well, what about the person that was traumatically beaten or abused by their parent? It's different, different levels. You know what I'm saying? So, so we have to be careful to move in compassion with people, but we have to address the ungodly beliefs. So we have to know that address sin, obviously, right? But also the ungodly beliefs. Because that and unforgiveness are the, one of the two main ways that demons remain in a person. So for next week, what we'll deal with, well, uh, you know, I want to teach on, on forgiveness. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, well, uh, just a portion of it. But we'll, we'll, we'll renounce certain things um, and, and, and cause a breakthrough to come uh, into your life, even over some generational issues. But I'm also, the reason I'm hesitating a little bit, because I'm also thinking about some Elijah House stuff that we may want to yeah. teach. So I'll throw something in yeah. on that. So uh, if you're going to be here every Wednesday, you should really just think of this as, um, you know, layering things on from one week to the next. So the, the sooner you start just taking notes, and when you pray in the morning, and just open your heart to what, what the Lord would want to show you, one of the things I've been revisiting is something called basic trust. And it's in those formative years when we're younger that a lot of times it's not a perfect fit. We didn't have both parents in the home or we didn't get the love that we may maybe needed or something specific in your family. So, for example, my relatives come from Italy. And, um, you know, when I did the DNA test, it's 100 percent Italian. Everything was right in that, you know, right in that loop which means it probably goes way back. And just at a family dinner one time, one of my uncles said, yeah, I was, at, I was in Italy and I visited the uh, Vatican and I went and looked up our family. And he said, uh, turns out in the year 400 when Constantine uh, made Christianity the official uh, religion, our family rebelled against that and went up in the mountains. And where we were, where our town is, it's called Pagan Rock. <laughs> Uh, a little hint there, maybe. There might be something to pray against. Um, now, you know, so I'm not saying you have to go do this extensive digging, but Holy Spirit's really good at bringing up the things that matter. And, and, and this basic trust issue is pretty much nobody grew up in a perfect home. Everybody has to cut your parents some slack and believe they did the best they could. We're not looking to do it to blame anybody. We're just looking for the Lord to give us compassion for the mistakes that they made, right? Because... They, you know, they never read a book on parenting, at least, you know, the people in my parents' generation, they were never told to do any of this stuff, right? So that makes it easier to forgive them, but it also makes, makes it easier for you to have compassion for them and to put the pieces together of where the trauma might have come in in your life. And it's not like we're trying to just do, they call it navel staring. We're not just shutting everything down and, oh my God, I'm such a mess. You have to live your life, but the Lord will give you clues. And he's not going to just back up a truck and dump everything out at once, right? Because you wouldn't be able to function half the time. So just allow him to work with you. And if you journal, if you, take, you, know, if you keep a journal, it can really help you see where some of those entry points were. And once you ask the Lord for that healing, it's easier to move on. I didn't mean to go so long, but... So I'm going to just... Are you done? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to pray right now because uh, I just feel that... Um, there, you may have some people, some people here may have, or someone online, people that you really have an issue with right now. And you may have chosen to forgive them, but you're still thinking cruel thoughts or evil thoughts about them. <laughs> and because you're hurt, right? And so I just feel like the Lord wants to release his healing balm over your, your, your soul and just, just heal your heart, all right? So I'm just going to pray. So Lord, we just thank you for your incredible love that you have for each and every one of us. And, and you're so proud of us, Lord, as sons and daughters, and your goal is to, your desire is for us to constantly keep moving forward in you. And Lord, we know that we cannot forgive. We can't do this without you when we've been so terribly hurt. But Lord, we ask with your, with your help, we choose to forgive. We choose to forgive, and, and you can, in your heart, you can say their name, 
um, or names, we choose to forgive the ones who have truly hurt us. I hear the Lord say there's been many who have experienced betrayal. There have been some who have been so disappointed by the way a loved one has act toward, acted towards you and that they, they just really have hurt your heart. I choose to forgive them, Lord, for abuse. I choose to forgive, Lord, those who have mocked me, that didn't protect me for dying. I choose to forgive him, Lord, for lying and for stealing. I choose to forgive him, Lord, for abandonment, for just not being there for me, for never coming through, for lying and say they'd be there and never even cared. Lord, I ask that you release your healing balm. Help me to walk through the process. Help me, Lord. I choose to release the bitterness, the resentment, the disappointment. I just heard the Lord say that there are some parents that have been so hurt over the behavior of your kids. And the Lord wants to heal you of that. Choose to forgive them. Lord, I ask that you bring reconciliation and restoration. But, Lord, we choose to release any bitterness or disappointment or hurt, shame, and humiliation that we may have experienced. But only you, Lord, only you, the healing balm of Gilead, the brooding presence of Holy Spirit can bring the healing as we submit, as we surrender. I just, I, the Lord just said there's some that you know for a fact you were rejected in your mother's womb. And you were rejected and you battled with rejection and abandonment issues. The Lord says he's here to heal you. Some have blamed God for what you went through. He's not the one. Don't turn from him. Come back to him. The Lord wants to heal your heart. Allow him in. He's the only one who could tear down the walls of isolation, of bitterness, of bondage, of captivity that has held you back. So, Lord, we just thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you, Lord, that we know that it's a process, and it's a victorious process as we surrender to you. And, Lord, I just thank you for your word that it says in Deuteronomy that you tenderly love us and you wrap us with your everlasting arms of comfort. And when you're really hurting and struggling or just feeling so alone, just picture the Lord's arms around you and just holding you tight. I love the scripture where it says that he has us engraved in the palm of his hand. He looks at our, our pictures every day. And we just thank you for your amazing love. He doesn't want any of you to feel unwanted or, or that you're looking from the outside. God's going to deal with this over this couple next couple of weeks of this abandonment issue of people feeling like you don't fit in, that you're on the outside looking in. The Lord says all are welcome. Come in. Don't you dare listen to that and say, well, you have to stay on the outside. So, Lord, I just bless each and every one here. I thank you for your amazing love. I thank you for healing and restoration and deliverance. I thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus, and greater is he that's in each and every one of us and he that's in the world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.